This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a real special show for you. Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources and I are going to talk about elk calling, your setups, and how important setups are in, in your calling. And uh, Chris's website, rowhuntingresources.com, is a phenomenal resource for elk sounds, uh, why elk make the sounds that they make. Um, Chris is a wildlife biologist and uh, is a very good elk caller, but more importantly, he has a lot of resources on his website of elk making particular sounds, uh, the whole gamut of sounds from, from all the sounds that cow elk make to all the different bugles, and, and Chris tries to break down each bugle gives demonstrations, not him demonstrating, but actual elk making the bugle, and he tries to identify uh, what type of bugles those are and what situations those bugles are used. He he takes all of the cow sounds and breaks each one of them down individually, and it's truly a phenomenal resource. Um, uh, The listeners are going to have an opportunity to uh, get a uh, discount uh, 10% discount uh, to join the elk module at Row Hunting Resources. And it's incredibly cheap uh, for the uh, actual amount of information that you would get. I've been a Row Hunting Resources member for a long time, and it's um, I use it for turkey, use it for elk. Uh, I don't hunt Midwestern whitetail deer very much, um, but the turkey and the elk, it's it's phenomenal. So check it out. Uh, There's a couple other things I want to talk about today, Uh, one of which is uh, the Arizona uh, Big Game Super Raffle is uh, coming coming to an end for the year. Uh, The mail orders are are due uh, July 10th. Online sales are over with on July uh, 12th. And this is an awesome, awesome opportunity to support the state of Arizona and the animals that live within it. I uh, w- want to be clear that each amount of money for each of the species, antelope, black bear, buffalo, coos whitetail, desert bighorn, elk, javelina, mountain lion, mule deer, and turkey, the money that's specifically raised by ticket sales for those individual species all goes back into that animal. So... It is an awesome opportunity to support those animals that we love to hunt. Not to mention, if you're the lucky winner of each hunt, you have a one-year-long tag that goes from August 15th to August 14th. Now, I, Dara and I have had the fortune of uh, guiding the Desert Bighorn Sheep Hunter three, for three years. Uh, we got some phenomenal uh, hunts in, and, and, and the hunters were able to get some great trophies. I've also been able to uh, guide the uh, Goulds turkey hunter last year, Michael Turner. We had a great hunt. Um, you know, you don't have to go with the guide if you win this hunt. A lot of people do it on their own. A lot of people go outfitted. So, you know, it's, a, it's your personal preference. But... You know, here's a chance, and there's a winner every year. So this is not one of these contests that you know you never see who wins. Someone wins this every year and gets a great hunt. So I want to encourage you guys to go to Arizona Big Game Super Raffle.com, purchase your tickets online. Uh, you can also, I believe, uh, print out a form and uh, mail it in. Uh, there's also a, a Swarovski Optics uh, package. Um, there is also a New Mexico trophy elk hunt raffle. So, um, support Arizona, support our animals. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is, um, you know, gohunt.com uh, insider is a sponsor of this podcast. 
I wanted to go over a few of the landowner tags that they have for sale. You can go on their website. Uh, also note that um, insider members uh, get a, I believe, a 10% discount on all of the landowner tags. There's 91 tags and hunts available that I see here on the website. Uh, a Mount Dutton, Ponce Gaunt, Johns Valley Rifle Antelope Tag, uh, New Mexico Unit 51 Rifle Elk Tag, um, New Mexico Unit 15 Muzzleloader Elk Tag Fully Outfitted. Uh, the dates of that are October 17th through the 21st or October 24th through the 28th or November 21st through the 25th. There's a Colorado Unit 66 either uh, sex archery elk tag, which uh, $3,500 from August 29th to September 27th. Uh, having hunted in, in Colorado Unit 66 uh, in the Gunnison Basin there outside of Lake City, is it's a beautiful place. Um, uh, there's a Colorado Unit 21 slash 30 private land only archery deer tag for $1,500. Uh, that goes August 29th to September 27th. There's a New Mexico Unit 15 muzzleloader elk tag. Um, uh, a Utah Cotton Thomas CWMU uh, deer tag. A Utah Ponsagant Hunter's Choice deer tag. Here's a, here's a premium opportunity to, to, to shoot a giant uh, mule deer. Uh, it's uh, Hunter's Choice, so you can choose the archery season, which is the 15th of August through September 11th, the muzzleloader season, which is September 23rd through October 1st, or the rifle October 17th through October 25th. Um, this uh, tag, they're asking $22,000. Uh, the insider price is uh, uh, $19,800. Um, many bucks in the 180 to 200 with a potential of a buck uh, breaking 220. Uh, this is on the Ponce in Utah, so this is a this is a really uh, unique opportunity here on this tag. Um, let's see, there's a Colorado Unit 21 slash 30 archery deer tag. That's you know 21 is a phenomenal unit. Uh, 21 slash 30 muzzleloader deer tag. Um, there's a there's a Colorado Unit 67 first rifle elk tag. Uh, Two thousand bucks. I mean, what a bargain. Uh, Colorado Unit 54 muzzleloader tag, uh, 3,000. Colorado Unit 54 rifle deer tag, 5,000. I mean, big bucks come out of uh, Unit 54. Here's a 54 second season rifle tag for 3,500. Um, let's see, more Colorado 21, New Mexico Unit 34 rifle elk tag, uh, Arizona, let's see. Nevada uh, uh, Unit 75 Hunter's Choice Elk Tag, uh, Utah Wasatch Mount Mountains Archery Elk Tag. Uh, that dates are August 15th to September 11th. Anyway, there, go on the website. There's a ton of great tags as I thumb through this. Um, and if you're an insider member, you obviously get a, a, a nice discount off of those tags. And what's nice about this is you can just buy the tag and go hunting. So, um, just a great resource here uh, with the GoHunt.com and GoHunt.com Insider. Uh, guys, I want to thank you for all your support on the podcast. Uh, the, the, the numbers and the amount of plays uh, that you guys have provided is, is, is mind-boggling. Uh, I never thought when I started this podcast that I would have gotten the support uh, that you guys have given this podcast. So I really want to thank you. My hat's off to you. I'm going to continue to try and bring... Uh, great stuff and, and great guests and try and bring as much information as I can to you. I appreciate all the support. Uh, if, if you have comments uh, or questions, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I uh, really appreciate the support on, on the Instagram account at jscottoutdoors, my associate Dar Colburn. Uh, on our Facebook page, J. Scott Outdoors, and our YouTube channel, J. Scott Outdoors. Um, of course, our blog, jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, you guys continue to uh, blow me away, and uh, I really appreciate the support. 
I'm looking forward to uh, the, the rivers here in Colorado. I'm up here for the summer and uh, my raft is ready to go. And um, the rivers are kind of at a 17 year high right now. Uh, they had a lot of snow in May and it stayed pretty cold. So we had a late runoff. Um, but uh, looking forward to a green drake hatch here in the Roaring Fork Valley and getting some of that good caddis action up on the Eagle River and the Eagle River Valley. So uh, it's going to be a good summer. We're getting prepared for all of our hunts. And I know I'm getting emails and messages from you guys every day about upcoming archery mule deer hunts and antelope hunts and doll sheep hunts, stone sheep hunts, uh, elk hunts coming up. So um, great time. It's an exciting time always uh, going into the fall. And uh, I just uh, thank you guys for your support. Let's get right to the podcast. And uh, you're going to really enjoy this episode with Chris Rowe. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a friend of mine, Chris Rowe from Rowe Hunting Resources. I've known Chris for a while now, and uh, Chris is a wildlife uh, bi biologist and uh, really has, a, has his finger on the pulse of animal behavior. Uh, Chris Row Hunting Resources focuses on animal behaviors, and uh, one of the things that I specifically like about what Chris is doing at Row Hunting Resources with his content that he has online through his modules, he has elk modules, deer modules, and turkey modules, is he actually focuses on what exactly the animals are saying. And one of the things that I can benefit from that is you know, not just out there making elk calls or not just out there making turkey calls, I can actually go, oh, this is what the animals are saying or this is what the animals need to be hearing right now instead of just making a, you know, blind cow call. Uh, Chris's modules have really helped me. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to have him on the show today to talk about row hunting resources and specifically today about his elk hunting module. Chris, how you doing? Doing all right, brother. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine. I'm excited to have you on. And, you know, I've had some great uh, guests on the podcast talking about uh, elk calling. And one of the things I wanted to have you on is because I believe there's a fundamental difference um, in, say, philosophy of uh, row hunting resources and some of the things that sh that you offer, as opposed to some of my other guests that are phenomenal callers and and are uh, very good in their own right. But your your stuff seems to be a little bit different. Do do you feel that there's a a difference in philosophy a little bit? I do, obviously. I mean, I think probably I'm a little biased, but I mean, first and foremost, you're right. I, I've listened to uh, you know most of your podcasts, and and there are. There's so many different ways to, you know, they talk about so many different ways to skin a cat. There's so many different ways to, to hunt elk and call elk. And there's really no right or wrong way. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, but I think you're right. From my standpoint, I really do personally put a lot of focus in understanding why elk do what they do. And when they vocalize, what are they saying and what are they trying to accomplish when they're saying it? I really do believe, and, and I think our module show our elk module shows this clearly, you know, elk do have certain vocalizations. They have words, just like we use words in our everyday lives in the English language or whatever language you speak, elk are the same. They are a very dynamic uh, social species, and they absolutely have specific vocalizations that they use for very specific purposes, and they expect a very specific outcome from that vocalization. And I, and for me, uh, understanding what those are, why they say them, has allowed me because I, I and. You know, this, I think, is another difference uh, for row hunting resources in the fact that our module, I hunt by myself. I hunt solo. I do not hunt generally with uh, another group of guys. I do, I do not have anybody calling for me back behind me. And if I do go hunt with somebody, sure, I will call for them or and with them. 
But 99.9% of the time, I'm the one doing the calling and I'm doing the shooting, which means I have to put an elk in front of me, in front of my effective range, in, in front of that opening. And so, and I also hunt on, on very heavily hunted public ground to where, you know, if I, if I call too much or if I call a lot or if I get an elk worked up and he's bugling his brains out, in five, ten minutes, there's going to be another hunter coming down the ridge and, and that just gives it a chance to, to blow the opportunity. So I have been, I think my approach and what I teach and what I share on row hunting resources, resources is more of a focus to what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Understanding why they do what they do. So the solo hunter can go out there and have a high level of confidence to say, okay, if I blow a cow call, not only do I know what cow call I'm going to blow and why I'm going to blow it, but more importantly, I know what the elk is going to perceive. I know what they're going to think, and I should have a, a reasonable expectation of what the outcome of my engagement is going to be. And that way, and, and when you start to understand why elk start doing things, I think it gives you much more flexibility in any situation that you're in to adapt and change the situation and do what, what is needed to, to get that animal in front of you. And I, you know, I talk about call them to your toes. I literally, I, I like calling elk to 10 yards and, and killing them point blank. And, and that's what row hunting resources elk module is about. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the other thing I might point out about the elk module is, you know, there's all kinds of advanced resources, you know, there's tons of educational, but one of the things that I think is so incredible about the module is the fact that everything that you talk about, you have video to show the elk doing that sound or acting in that certain behavior so that, and it, it, that's what uh, relates to me so much is that, you know, I can watch your elk behavior. I can watch the, you know, the see you first, the doorway, um, I can listen to all of the different cow elk and bull elk vocalizations where you've broke down specifically on the module per video. You know, you've got the chirp, the mew, the lost mew, the assembly mew, the demanding mew, the selfish mew. You know, you've got, you know, and, and, and many more. You've got contact bugles, dominant bugles, chuckles, you know, check bugles, roars. I guess my point is you you, you have dissected elk vocabulary and elk behavior and and you're able to show that with video which to me I'm kind of a visual guy and I kind of need to see it and then I need to kind of hear it and then go oh I've heard that all the time that's what you know Chris is calling a you know a, a challenge bugle or or that's what he's calling a selfish mew and oh I've heard that I thought that was you know I thought that was the estrus call. Oh, it, now I see it. I, I and now I can relate to what I've seen in the woods. And I think that's what's so awesome about row hunting resources. And I think that's some of the the you know every every season before elk season when I spend a lot of time on on row hunting resources in the elk module. That's what I take away from it. Well, and and I, a I, I'll agree. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because for two reasons. Um, Number one, I, the real easy one is I've always been the type of person, you know, I, I started my career out as far as, you know, this type of stuff, given seminars. And, you know, I've attended a bunch of seminars over my life and, and anybody can get up and flap their gums at you. And, and some people are better at it than others. But you, unless you see it happening, a lot of times you, you have this doubt in your mind. You're like, hmm, I don't know about that. Well, that's the whole point of why we do the video. I, you know, I can flap my gums and I can tell you every, anything I want to tell you, but it's not until I can show you, say, okay, if I'm going to talk about a glunk or if I'm going to talk about uh, assembly me or whatever, then I can say, here's, here's what it is. Here's what it means. Don't believe me. Don't take my word for it. Watch this next video or next five or 10 or whatever and watch the elk do it themselves, but more importantly, watch and listen, and then watch the body language, watch the posturing, and watch the other elk react to that. Now, that's, and that's what I love about it, but the other thing that I hope, you know, and, and you and I have talked about it before, 
you just nailed it that some everybody learns differently. Some people learn by reading. Some people learn best by doing. Other people learn from a visual. Well, what we try to do with our videos is do a little of everything. We, we try to have it to where it's very visual um, so that way you can hear it, you can see it, you can practice with it. And you're, you're, it's not, you're, you're not practicing with me. You're practicing with a cow elk. You're practicing with a bull or you're practicing with 10 other bulls or whatever. So yeah, I, I having the video and, and that is also why we do everything online because it are the, the module is like a library. So, you know, we were talking about before this, I'm literally sitting in front of my computer right now and I've got about a dozen new videos that I'm getting, I'm working on that are going to be uploaded to the elk module this summer. It's, you know, you have instant access to so many video resources that I, you know, you can't do with a book. You can't do with a magazine you can do it kind of with a DVD, but then you, you have to keep buying a, a tangible item with a, with what we do on the line. Man, you, you can take it with you wherever you want it. Well, yeah, you can use it on your mobile device. Yeah. I mean, you can be in Elk Camp if you have service, and you can be pulling some of that stuff up to get, you know, refreshers of, you know, what just happened that morning, and, oh, this is what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm uh, proud of it, but I'm I'm glad you like it, and I know that a lot of other people like it too, and so – you know, and, and not to mention to have the, the forum where it's Row Hunting Resources members that subscribe to the Elk module, um, you know, being able to ask questions and, and chat with each other, having watched some of the videos and listened to some of your expl ex explanations and be able to, you know, dive into it deeper. And not only that, have you come in and, you know, kind of um, lead the lead the conversation along uh, is, is a incredible resource. Chris, one thing that when I first heard it, it just blew me away and it, it really made a lot of things, you know, kind of come full circle. And that is talking about your elk behavior, talking about the doorway, talking about see you first, hear you second, um, smell you third. Can you talk to me a little bit about those things? Yeah, you bet. I, you know, I, I truly believe that I don't care if you listen to anything that I talk about on my calling. I don't care if you're the best caller in the world. It does not matter if you don't have your setup right. And I think that one thing right there, above all else, if a hunter, if, a, if an elk hunter fo takes a minute to focus on getting their setup right, then so many other things are going to fall into place from a from a success standpoint of your calling effort and all the way down to finally, you know, punching your tag, having a shot opportunity. And again, when we're talking about solo hunting, you know, that is even more critical. Everybody always, always, always talks about elk that hang up. They, you know, they, they hung up at 80 yards. They hung up at 100 yards or whatever. They hung up just out of range. And quite honestly, the fact that elk hang up just out of range is why the two-person or you know multiple caller uh, strategies essentially became developed because you put the shooter out front, you put the callers in the back. That way, you're pulling the bull past that shooter because he's you know if he's responding to the the callers that are a hundred yards away, well then hopefully if he quote unquote hangs up a hundred yards from the callers, well he's still in range of the guy that's shooting. Well, it, it absolutely works. But it's not until I started focusing and, and paying attention, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why are they hanging up? If, if the bull was 400 yards away from me when I first started calling, and he made up 320 yards and then stopped at 80, well, it's not because I wasn't calling correctly. Well, he just came 320 yards. Of course I was calling correctly. He, he responded. If the wind is in my face, well, he didn't smell me. If I've got good camouflage on and I didn't move, well, he didn't see me. What in the world? Why is he hanging up? Well, the most obvious answer is, well, he got to a point where he should be able to see that animal calling. Yes. And so if we start to pay attention to say, okay, where is that animal going to stop? Where is, how is that animal going to move across the landscape? 
I, you know, in my seminars, I, I would put it in, in terms of how we ourselves, uh, how, how we walk through our own houses, all right, our, our, our own home. You know, if we're sitting down on the li- in the living room on the couch watching the ball game or something, and our spouse or our kids call to us and need our assistance in the in the back bedroom, well, we don't go to the garage looking for them, right? I mean, we know what our house is and, and the layout of our house, and we know where that that vocalization where they called to us from. So. Most of us are going to get up out of our couch, you know, we're going to walk across the room, up the stairs, around the corner, down the hallway, and we're going to go to the room that they're they're talking from. And most people get that concept. They're like, okay, well, yeah, the, you know, the you know the bedding area on a mountain is is their bedroom, and that meadow down below is the feeding area, and the the elk trail that goes up that ridge that's their hallway. Most people get that concept. But where I take it a step further with the doorway principle is is saying, okay, let's go from there. Let's think about what you and I do. If we get up out of a chair and, and we go up the stairs, around the corner, down the hall, and we get to the bedroom where we think our our wives are calling to us from, what do we do? If you think about it, most of the time, and, and most of these things happen almost instantaneously in our brain. We get to the doorway of that room, and we instantly go visual, and, and it happens in milliseconds. If we get to the doorway of that room, and our spouse is standing where we can see them, we instantly see, we recognize, and if they're doing something, we instantly go, oh, there you are. That's what you're doing. You must need help. And we continue on into that room and we go and we engage them. But say we get to the doorway of that room and we step in and they're nowhere to be seen. Do we, A, either you know, walk into the room and we just circle the, the room around and around and, and try to you know, find them? Or do most of us pause, vocalize, say, uh, where are you? And then wait for a response. And then I'll, maybe they're in the closet and they say, oh, can you come in here in the closet? Oh, okay. I can't see you in the closet, but I hear you in the closet. So now I'm going to move through this room. I'm going to move through the doorway. I'm going to move across the room and I'm going to go to the doorway of the closet. And then I'm going to reevaluate from there. If you think about it, most of us do that. We, we pause at that point where we think we should be able to see whoever's vocalizing you know to us and if we don't see them we pause and we either vocalize we pause we wait and we try to figure out what's going on elk are no different the only thing that we need to do is flip how we assess our setups and the one thing that i tell people is if you know most of us Bull bugles a long way away. We call. He responds. We make up distance. He makes up distance. And at some point, it's going to be close enough to where we need to get set up. Most of the time, we fall back on ourselves and we say, okay, where do I need to set up so I have, you know, the most shooting lanes? Or where do I need to set up to where I can see him approaching? Or whatever. We assess what we need in order for us to be able to make that shot or for our camo to blend in or for us to get as much cover to help you know hide us when we draw our bow we think about what we need first and then we hope the elk comes all the way through and gives us a shot opportunity unfortunately most of us don't stop to think okay that elk is walking through his house Where is the doorway to the room, quote unquote, that I am calling from? Where is he going to naturally stop? If we stop and take two seconds, and it takes a little practice, but you'll get it. If we take two seconds and assess what's around us, where the bull is coming from, how he's coming, and, and what he's walking through, if we take two seconds and go, where is the natural opening 
where he is going to stop to look into this area. If we identify that first, then make sure we get set up within effective range of that location or that area, it it absolutely blows your success rate out of the wall. I mean, it just absolutely, your success will go up exponentially because now not only is that elk going to walk right to where you think he's going to walk. Not only is he now you're set up to where you have a clear shot opportunity at that, but more importantly, you don't have to make any sort of vocalization to stop the bull. You know, a lot of other you know people say all the time that, you know, some of the problems they've had is, you know, that animal's walking through and walking, walking, and they, and they try to stop him and either can't stop him and he walks right through the shooting lane and he's gone or when he when they make a vocalization they try to stop him and and he spooks a little bit and he shifts and turns or moves and now he's out of position or he's at a bad angle and now he's looking straight right through him and now they can't draw their bow they can't get a shot and the, and the setup's blown if you set up within range of that doorway you don't have to say anything because he's naturally going to pause there it's 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 a beautiful thing. Once you start looking at it from the doorway principle, your setups, that is, I think, the number one issue that most most people have, you know, with their success each year is just making sure their setups are correctly. And that's what that doorway principle talks about. That's awesome stuff. And Chris, give me an example of, say, what what are the majority of the doorways that you see? Give me kind yeah. of a you know, is it a meadow? Is it a what is it that you look for in that scenario? Ninety percent of the time, it's a transition between cover. So, you, you you like you said the meadow. If if you know the elk are coming out and and feeding in a meadow, say they're going from thick dark timber out into a meadow. Well, the doorway itself very well could be the edge of the meadow. If the if the timber is so thick and dark. They they might have to literally walk out, poke their head out of the timber, and look into that meadow to be able to see where you know where something is. Or you might have they they might be in that thick bedding area, that thick nasty dark green timber, but then there is an aspen stand, and that transition between the dark timber and that aspen stand, or that aspen stand into an open meadow, it's that transition point. Most of the time, for me, I've seen it's just that transition type. Or transition between the type of cover, how dense and thick it is. Sometimes it is terrain. Sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll come up and they'll poke, you know, maybe you have a bench and either they're below the bench, they're above the bench or whatever. They come up and they'll stand right on the edge of the bench and they'll look over or they'll come up to it and they'll, they'll just peek up over the top or, or over a saddle. Sometimes it's terrain, but generally speaking, it is at that transition point where they can't see from you know it's it they can't see in from where they are where they're coming from and it's that point where they can step out and now they have visual clarity to be able to see where you're coming from sometimes the doorway is you know 10 yards i mean it's it's a very short tiny defined little little point on the map other times like you, you know you're talking hunting some of these big you know, well for you down in arizona sometimes these big open stands of ponderosa pine or for some of us that hunt big stands of aspen, sometimes they can look 200 yards out across that open country. You know, if that's the case, you know, they could stand 200 yards away. Well, now I've got to try to figure out, okay, how can I position myself to where maybe I've got some thick, nasty stuff behind me? Maybe I have a clump of thick uh, garbage blowdowns or, or just a patch of timber or something. Some sort of feature that is going to block his ability to see beyond it in order to get them to come across that but it's usually that transition zone from one cover type or one cover density to another do you think having good setups and being able to recognize the doorway is more important or equally important as sounding really good with your calls to be honest, as much as I talk about calling and, and, and effective calling, I will say that your setup is more important. And the only reason why I say that is we've all been there to where either A, we've got a buddy that just can't call to save his life and, and just sounds horrible, but yet somehow he, he, he or she's successful. But 
more importantly than that is it, you're dealing with testosterone. You're dealing with an animal that's that's ramped up and, and starting to get in that breeding cycle, that breeding urge. You've got younger animals, you've got older animals. Sometimes that testosterone just, I mean, it's crazy what they will do and what they'll respond to. And there's some animals that just sound horrid anyway. So even if you're not the best caller, as long as you're, you've got the intent right and you're calling from the right area, you know, again, if, you know, I, there's another example I'd give, and we can talk about it here in a minute if you want to, about, you know, why am I saying what I'm saying and, and the sentences I'm building. You know, as long as you're in the right area where calling makes sense, sometimes those bulls, especially the younger bulls, they don't care. They hear something, they're just going to come running in because it, one of the things I talk about is, you know, you never make an elk do anything except maybe run away. All you can do is put in their mind what maybe they ought to do or what's in their best interest to do at the time. And when we're dealing with bulls ramped up on testosterone, you know, you mentioned the see you first, hear you second, smell you third principle. You know, the see you first, visual communication, body language is is crucial for elk. And so it is in their best interest to be the first one on scene to make visual contact with, say, a cow that, that's vocalizing and, and, you know, if a bull wants that cow and there are other bulls in the area, sometimes the first bull on scene is the one that has the best opportunity to take that cow and, and pull him into her harem or her his harem. So you can be a bad caller and still see success if you get your setups correct. Because the other the, uh, the the flip side of that is is equally well, I guess not true. You can be the best call in the world, but if you don't have your setups right, you won't be successful. You just won't. Yeah, I mean, that's what you're saying there is really nobody else is saying that. And that, that that's I want to expose that because I think that's such a fundamental thing that, you know, people focus so much on trying to sound good. But like you say, they they may sound good and they may be saying the right things, but they're saying it from the wrong position, such as you're in that scenario where your wife's calling you from down the hall, in the room, whatever, up the stairs, and you're on the couch and you may be answering her, what do you need, what do you need? Well, you're not going to have that interaction because she's not going to tell you what she needs from three rooms away. She wants you to be yeah. – you know, right there close to say, I'm trying to hang this picture. Will you grab the thing? Get, yeah. you know, get in. I there. need your help. Come here. Right. Okay. okay. Right. All right. Well, I, I'm telling you, Jay, I mean, that's the thing is I would much rather deal with 10 good, effective, efficient hunters in the same valley that I'm dealing with than one or two idiot hunters. I, you know, I, if, if you're a good, if you understand these things and, and you're able to implement them, then you can get in and out and surgically engage those elk and, and slip right back out without ever disturbing them. Or you just get in there, you, you fill your tag and then you're out rather than just chase, chase, bump, 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 spook, spook, spook. And then all of a sudden the, the whole valley's gone. I mean, you're, you, you're done. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. I just, Yeah. Awesome stuff. Um, Chris, in, in knowing your elk module, your strategies in action, I think, are pretty awesome because you actually set up certain scenarios. Um, and I guess I need to make the listeners aware, inside the elk module, you have, you know, elk gallery, which has all the bull elk, cow elk uh, vocalization, the glossary. You can actually see the elk doing that you know, sound, but then you have the strategies in action. Talk to me a little bit uh, about how you, why and how you formulated the strategies in action. And I assume that it's because you wanted to be able to take people from hearing all of that and seeing those sounds and hearing those sounds to actually implementing them. And then it, you walk people through in actual calling situations of this is what the bull's doing, this is what I need to do now, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, it, 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 absolutely. And just so the listener has a visual of, of what we're talking about, when you go in the elk module, I have it split out with 
what I call foundation principle. Imagine a pyramid. You know, in your mind, think of a pyramid that has different levels. You remember that old food pyramid that we all, we all see when yeah. growing up? You know, you have the grains at the bottom and then sweets are at the top. Well, imagine that. Imagine that food pyramid. All right. The the foundation principles are a series of videos that you know that that are the foundation of just calling and understanding what you're doing. So elk elk behavior. Cow elk vocalizations and communication, bull elk vocalization and communication, those in understanding cow calls and understanding bugles and bugle to all that stuff is the foundation principles. What once you see that, you go, okay, now I understand. Then, like you said, you got the gallery where now it's what I I kind of label it as that recognition. So we move up on that pyramid a little bit to where now you the gallery just shows just raw video footage of elk doing what elk are doing not a hunting situation there's there's no hunting whatsoever it's just me or kelly or someone just videoing elk doing what elk are doing no interaction by humans whatsoever it's elk period done well that allows you to kind of recognize and see what it is that we just talked about in the foundation principles well the next step if we go up on the strategies in action the, the strategies in action videos we go to the next step up in that pyramid. You're absolutely right. We we talk about the foundation. Okay, here here are the here are the meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts of what we're talking about. Okay, you went and you looked in the gallery and you can see and, and now you recognize what the elk are doing. Okay. The strategies in action now is saying, okay, well, let's take that. Now let's put it in play. Let's let's go out into the field and let's do it. Let's let's we're, we're going to use the doorway principle. We're going to use the see you first, hear you second, smell you third. We're going to use it, you know, I break out some of my, uh, in the Elk Hunter strategy app, it's a it's a application kind of function that we created that allows you to go through and play through different scenarios and, and learn about different scenarios. Well, in there, I talk about a, a passive strategy, targeted strategy, or aggressive strategies. How do you want to go and engage these animals. Do you want to do it very passively? Do you want to do it targeted where you're going right at them and very purposefully? Or is it a situation where you need to be very aggressive and, and let's use an aggressive strategy? Well, in the strategies in action, it is. It's just, okay, we're in the field. We're in September or early October. We're calling animals and we're going to put all these things in play and let's see how it unfolds. And some of the videos are me just going out there and calling and we see what happens. Others, though, and, and this, I think, is important to show kind of, of the fact that what I'm talking about it has some legitimacy in the fact that, you know, some of these videos I'll say, okay, here we are. This is what the situation is. And before I even make one vocalization or one call, I say, this is the strategy I'm going to use. This is why I'm going to use it. And bam, I do. And we either call an, uh, you know, call an animal right straight to the camera or we don't, and I talk about why. So that's what the Strategies in Action video series does, and that's what I'm working on now. I've got a pile of other ones that you know from last year that, that I'm putting in place. Some of them are active hunts. Some of the hunts that I have done and been on and videoed, and you know maybe we kill an elk or maybe I don't kill an elk, but they're an actual hunt. Other ones are just strictly you know me going out in the woods calling with a video camera and nothing else. Yeah, and let me ask you a question. You, you've spent some time in Arizona, um, and you've spent some time hunting other states. My question would be, in, in, let's compare, let's say, Colorado and Arizona. For the listeners out there, how would you compare calling elk in Colorado as a – did you notice any differences in calling elk in Arizona? Well, other, aside from the fact that, you know – in some of the areas that I was in Arizona are they're you know, managed more for that trophy management. So you've got way more bulls, you know, your bull to cow ratio is much, much, much higher than in, in some of the areas that I was down there in Arizona, than where maybe some of the over the counter areas that I've hunted in Colorado made, you know, in Arizona there, you correct me, I'm just going to take a stab. What are you dealing with? 50, 60 bulls per hundred cows. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the unit, but sure. you know, mo most of the units that you were in nine and twenty-three are the four. You know, they try and manage for, I believe, forty bulls, forty to fifty bulls okay. per cow. There you go. 
So, you know, some of our over-the-counter areas in Colorado that hunt, literally we might be 15 to 25 bulls. So you've got fewer bulls to deal with. And you're and we're talking, just to be clear, 15 to 20 per 100, yes. and I was saying 40 to 50 per 100. Yes, yes. Right. Yep. Yep. right. No, good clarification. Um, so right there we're dealing with fewer bulls as far as the population goes, number one. Number two um, – also age structure, you know, in Colorado, in many areas, you're dealing with a much younger age, age structure of bulls. But to be honest, I've hunted, I've had the, the, the pleasure of hunting Wyoming, Colorado. And now in Wyoming, it was, it was not a trophy managed unit. However, I was very fortunate to be behind a gigantic, uh, private ranch. So it, it, we were the only people I mean, when I say miles, I mean, boom, miles. So we were in the middle of nowhere. Um, so the bulls up there were just like what I saw down in Arizona. I have hunted limited draw units in Colorado from very, very trophy uh, oriented units up in the northwest part of Colorado. They are the same up there as they are where I was hunting last year in the center part of the state. It's a four point unit. So it's not really a quote unquote trophy unit, but it just has a higher quality. I've hunted New Mexico on private land on a on a piece of ground that is managed for elk, and and the same thing goes. So the only different, I mean, I've always said elk are elk are elk. I mean, elk behavior is elk behavior. Now we might have a you know there might be might be a discussion on is the behavior of a Roosevelt elk different than the behavior of a Rocky Mountain elk? We That might be a conversation. But when we're talking about Rocky Mountain elk, elk behavior is elk behavior. Elk vocalizations are elk vocalizations. The only thing that I see that is different is how those animals react to and interact with the habitat and the pressure that they they deal with on a daily basis. So in some of these over the counter units where I am in Colorado, they 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 are not as vocal. They do I mean they just don't get rip roaring cranking like you see in some of these you know trophy managed areas. But they respond exactly the same. When they do a contact bugle, it means the exact same thing. Whether you're talking about New Mexico, Arizona, New Me- you know Wyoming, doesn't matter. You know, I and I take a step back. I, you know, and I say contact bugle. Sometimes people will call that a location bugle. Um, but regardless, you know, if they're going to bugle that way, it means exactly the same thing across the board. When a cow does a loss mew or an assembly mew, it means the exact same thing. And because of that, you can expect the same sort of reaction, and that everybody's going to understand it. So. There really is no difference, and I, I hope that that comes out and comes across in the strategies and action videos because, you know, some of the, t- the the two latest videos that I have up there are active hunts. They are from Colorado. They're on over-the-counter areas. That's where other people are hunting, and I do exactly what I do in all the other videos, and I show you the exact same result. Yeah, and it's good stuff, I can attest. I haven't seen the, the <clears throat> two new ones, but um, the strategies in action are awesome. Um, in your opinion, if you could pick one mistake that you think people make while elk calling slash elk hunting, the single biggest mistake, what would it be? If I... For call, if if we're talking specifically with calling, calling with an application of calling while elk hunting, yes. it is going to be a very strong toss up between just bugling for no other. I mean, bugling way too much and too aggressively for no reasonable purpose. Or just throwing way too many cow calls out there. Just all sorts. Of, people say, I want to sound like an elk. And, and in their mind, that means just making all sorts of sounds and just, just throwing them all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just going nuts. It's like, okay, what? Again, now, 
I, I'm not saying that's not going to be successful because there are some people that have success with it. But when you look across the landscape and say, okay, on average, you know, what's their percent success on, you know, if we say I have 10 encounters with a bull or 10 elk, you know, what's my percentage in calling those animals in? A lot of times the people that don't understand, in my opinion, if they don't understand why they are doing what they're doing and what they're doing, they're just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and hoping to see what sticks. I think that right there ends up costing people more than uh, other than just calling. I think that is the one or those things that cost the people the most. Yeah, and I I really agree with you. It's kind of like a good analogy would be like if you were you had your turkey box call in your hand and you were going to go out and turkey hunt and you have learned to yelp on the box, you've learned to cluck on the box, you've learned to purr on the box, you've learned to gobble on the box. And it would be as if you went out there and you sat down by your tree and you heard a bird gobble and you went, yelp, 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 you yelped, you went, put, put, put. you clucked, you went, put, put, put. you purred, and then you gobbled on the same box. I mean, yes, those are all sounds yeah. that turkeys make, yeah. but you are making them simultaneously be right behind each other and that's not natural and I think for me one of the biggest mistakes I think people make specifically talking about Arizona is they like to bugle they like to get the elk to answer and then they like to continue in to the elk still bugling yeah and what I find is most of the bulls in Arizona you know reach you know six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, even older. And they've seen that program of the hunter bugling, you know, oh, I haven't heard the bull in a while, let's bugle again. And then let's move another 50 yards and let's bugle again. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. Just, but, that does not work. And, and the thing is, it's, it's and I'm not going to say, you know, Arizona, you, you know, I, you and I have talked about this, you know, some areas, well, let's, okay, let's use your example. Um, we talked last year about you had an opportunity. You've always hunted, you know, you guide in, in Arizona, but you had an opportunity last year to hunt Montana. And in Arizona, you've, we've talked about the fact that they just don't seem to respond to bugles like they do with cow calls. Whereas you went to Montana and my gosh, you could, I mean, cow call, big deal. You throw a bugle at them and they just come unglued. Oh, it was unbelievable after a couple of days. I mean, I sweet talked a few bulls and, but if Jason, He's like, you have a bugle? And I said, yeah, it's back at camp. He goes, let's bring it tomorrow. About, I don't know, halfway into the first morning, he's like, do you have that bugle? And I said, yeah. And he goes, give it to me. And he takes it out and he rips out a bugle. Then he starts just stomping on this tree. And I'm not talking about like raking a tree. I'm talking about like Jason Harrison got in a fight with this tree. <laughs> And I mean, he's bugling and he's jumping up and down and he's breaking branches and going crazy. And I'm thinking, if you did this in Arizona, you know, the elk would laugh at you. But the reality is they probably wouldn't. And he goes crazy. And all of a sudden, five or six or seven bulls all around us just light up and they started coming our way. Yeah. And so I learned a good lesson there in that, you know, sometimes what works at your home turf doesn't, you know, might not work or you might find things that that work better and you know i definitely learned that bugling in montana is is uh definitely a way to get those bulls really fired up well and the the point being and this is something that i talk about in all my stuff and why i i set up my strategies the way i do is you nailed it not not all areas are created equal it's not that it's it's not that bugling doesn't work or it's not that bugling works of course, it's a tool. You're, you're calling, and I think people need to realize this, or I wish more people realize this. The calling that you're doing is is nothing more than a tool. Dan Evans has killed more big bulls than I know of anybody else, and I don't think he hardly calls at all. He stalks them like a mule deer, and he's, I mean, he smokes some great big bulls. 
Whereas you've got folks like uh, Corey Jacobson, he loves to bugle. You just did their podcast with him, and he talks about he. That's what he wants to do. He wants to find the bull that wants to to come to a bugle. That's what his passion is, and so that's what he does. And those are two ends of the spectrum. But what people need to realize is that isn't the end all be all. You don't have to just pick one and and ex, you know there, there's an old adage. To the person who has only a hammer, the entire world ends up looking like a nail. Okay? So not every tool is going to fit every situation. And so, you know, some I have a perfect example. I uh, is in Colorado, over-the-counter unit. I ju- literally, it was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and all of a sudden I'm up next to this bedding area, up in the dark timber, up towards timberline. And these two bulls start cutting loose. And I, as soon as I hear them bugle, I'm like, they're dead. I mean, one of them these is dead. I mean, these, these are callable. That, done. So sure enough, I sneak my way in, get set up, boom, hit him with a targeted strategy. And I mean, I put one right smack dab in my lap, boom, shoot him. He goes down. Yay, I filled my tag. Well, meanwhile, the second bull is losing his mind that now his buddy isn't anywhere around. He's not answering. No, he's not. And now I stop calling. I don't need to call anymore because I'm, I'm, you know, quartering up my elk. Well, this elk is just going nuts. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to have some fun with this thing. And so I, every now and then I throw him a cow call and, and I'm, or just a mew or whatever. And this thing would – so he's circling me in the dark timber, okay, it just screaming his head off. Well, about halfway through – and I'm quartering this elk, okay. At some point I know this bull smelled me. Well – about halfway through me quartering this elk, I can hear a hunter coming up the up up the ridge, and he's bugling. And as he gets caught, I mean, he is just, I mean, he's laying it out. To, I mean, he's just doing, you know, beautiful competition style bugle. Well, every time he bugles, the bull would shut up and just stand there and be silent. And then the guy would continue coming. So all of a sudden, here we get this situation where the hunter bugles, the bull shuts up. The bull goes silent for five to ten minutes, and then no, there's nothing going on in the woods anywhere. All of a sudden, the bull starts up again. He bugles a couple more times, gets cranked up, and all of a sudden, the hunter bugles at him again. Bull shuts up. And I'm literally, for like 10, 15 minutes, he's going back up. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're bugling at this bull. Just throw him a cow call, and he's going to run over you. And... I, I mean, I finally did. I just, at the top of my voice, I just yelled across the, the woods. I was like, use a cow call! Bull, bull <laughs> bugles at me. You know, I mean, just, I was like, if you get stuck on doing the, the same thing over and over again and not realizing that there are other tools in the toolbox, you're going to limit yourself. If you go to Arizona, or you, I don't care where you are, if you go to an area where the elk generally want are, are responding to cow calls, you should be able to use cow calls and use them effectively and know what you're saying. Whereas you might throw out all these cow calls in the world and not get a response, but now you have a bugle with you. If you can transition and say, okay, well, they didn't want a cow call. I know what I'm doing with my bugle. I start using a bugle. Boom. You use the tool that is going to fit the, the task at hand. And I think that's, you know, some of these people that just go in the woods and, and say, I want to sound like an elk. Well, I've got video footage of Rocky Mountain National Park. I can put, I can park you in the middle of a herd of 300 elk. The only thing you're going to hear are the magpies out there squawking. I mean, they're they're dead silent. Just because there's a lot of elk doesn't mean there's a lot of sound. So it, I don't know. I I think for calling purposes, back to your original question, I think if if you're just throwing stuff at the wall hoping to see what sticks, yes, you can be successful if you find the right bull that wants to play your game. But in some of the areas, at least, that I know that I hunt, you might be walking by one, two, three, a half dozen elk in the woods that you never even know that are there that are willing to work a call, but just not the ones that you're throwing at them. Sure. And I think that's where the elk module, row hunting resources, really comes in, and it's worth its weight in gold. Um I want to commend you on the job you've done with it. It's unlike any resource I've seen. And I want to thank you for being on today, but I want to give you a chance to let people know where they can find you, uh, how they can find you. 
Um, and I just appreciate you being on with us today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. I, no, I, I always enjoy talking with you, but no, if people want to check it out, it, like I said, it's kind of like an on, it's a, it's a, you basically what you do is you subscribe and you kind of get a, like a library card. So, you know, it gives you access and then everything that's in there is, is open for you to, to look at. And like I said, I'm building more stuff right now and I'm constantly adding it. So yeah, I, I like it. I'm, I'm proud of it, but it's a work in progress and I, I, I'm still, not satisfied with all the stuff that I could have in there and I'm, I'm working on that. So, but if people do want to check it out, it's just row hunting resources.com. It's R O E hunting resources.com. And if you go to the main, main page there, you know, you know, those, there's a place where you says sign up and, and you can, you know, for the elk module, there's two, there's two different ways that you can access the elk information. Either just sign up for the elk module itself, which just opens up the, the elk library and you can have a, it basically gives you a three month pass to the elk library or you can get the full annual subscription. So it's 365 days from when you sign up and it opens up everything. So everything's there for you to, to peruse through. But either way, you can just sign up. Um, and, and and when you say everything, not to interrupt you, but sure. when you say everything, what you mean then is the full turkey module, sure. which goes yes. through all of the turkey vocalizations and all of the turkey behaviors, yep. and the uh, deer module, which goes through all of the white-tailed deer uh, behaviors and, and all the cycles of the rut and the, and the noises they make and the behavioral patterns and such. Yeah, and, and that's a good clarification. Yeah, and by by, I mean – by far the the biggest module is our elk that that is where i started that is my passion that is what i what i focus on turkey i've got some stuff in there and then deer is just there's a few things in there deer and i'm going to do some more with some of the habitat stuff that we do here in kansas but regardless the elk module is by far the the largest one and the one that i add the most to so and and like i did for you guys with the with the turkey one Anybody that, that listens to this podcast and wants to sign up, if they go, there's a spot. If you if you click the sign up, there's a spot lower down on the information page that says if there's a coupon code or discount or whatever. If they type in J. Scott Podcast, all one word, just J. Scott Podcast, it'll take 20% off. So, Okay. And um, the elk module is how much, Chris? Uh, twenty four bucks or twenty. It said essentially twenty five bucks. So with your discount, it's a twenty bucks for th- the three months, or the full annual subscription is fifty bucks. It'll be forty bucks for anybody that's listening for this. And and just so the listeners understand, I mean, this isn't like two or three videos. I mean, this is like <laughs> thirty or forty videos, uh, and maybe more specifically, you know. Having elk demonstrate the mew, the lost mew, the alarm bark, the aggravated whine, the frustrated whine. I mean, all these different sounds and bulls chuckling, glunks, huffs, alarm barks, you know. Um, yeah. So, you know, you, in your humbleness, you weren't exactly spelling out. I mean, we're talking a lot, like hours and hours worth of resource here that you can learn. And so um, I just wanted to be clear on that because – you know, this elk module is phenomenal. And, you know, from the very first time I went on it years ago, I've loved it and I appreciate you doing it. And uh, I appreciate you offering that discount to the listeners and appreciate having you on. Uh, they can also find you at uh, rowhuntingresources.com, correct? And on Facebook? Well, yeah, a- any of whether it's our website, Facebook, just Row Hunting Resources. We've got a YouTube channel where I've got a pile of other videos on there, and that's just again Row Hunting Resources YouTube channel, uh, Instagram. Yeah, we, they, if you type in Row Hunting Resources in any of your your most of your social media stuff or our website, it, it's going to come to us. So, but yeah, awesome. but yeah, you you joke about that. Yeah, I mean, if if someone went to the elk module and they wanted to start, you know, from the first video all the way to the end, it, it's now right now it's it's over 15 hours of, of video. So. Yeah, phenomenal stuff. Um, where are you going to be found this year in the elk woods? Did you draw any tags, or what do you have in front of you uh, this season? Well, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, no, I did not. I drew my tag last year, so I'm zero. I I, I had no preference points, so I'm going to be over the counter in Colorado again. But right now, man, that is up in the air. We are 
Uh, Colorado's going through another year like it was 2011 to 2012 where we had a, just a, a significant moisture year and we've got snowpack up high to where I'm kind of holding off and I'm going to probably wait and see as we get towards, you know, end of July and the beginning of August to see what conditions are to kind of really hone in whether I want to go south, southern Colorado, or whether I want to go back to some of my, you know, other areas in the central part of the state. So I really am. I'm going to be over the counter like everybody else is, but I'm Man, it's up in the air. It's it's up in the air of where I really want to settle in and go this year. So we'll see. Well, you'll be in Colorado somewhere yeah. and uh, look forward to seeing your new videos um, that you come up with this season. And I and, uh, appreciate you being on. I appreciate you being a friend of the podcast and uh, uh, look forward to uh, talking with you again. Absolutely. Always, my friend. All right, buddy. You take care. And uh, uh, until next time, God bless you. Okay. All right. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today.